Chapter Three of the Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland, Chapter Three, The Quiet Calling. Now oft had I heard tell, not only in that great city which occupied the thousandth floor, but in others of the one thousand three hundred and twenty cities of the pyramid that there was somewhere out in the desolation of the nightlands a second place of refuge, where had gathered in another part of this dead world some last millions of the human race to fight unto the end. And this story I heard everywhere in my travels through the cities of the Great Redoubt, which travels began when I came upon my seventeenth year, and continued for three years and two hundred and twenty-five days being even then but one day in each city, as was the custom in the training of every child. And truly it was a great journey, and in it I met with many whom to know was to love, but whom never could I see again, for life was not space enough, and each must to his duty to the security and well-being of the redoubt. Yet for all that I have set down we travelled much always but there were so many millions, and so few years. And as I have said, everywhere I went there was the same story of this other place of refuge, and in such of the libraries of those cities as I had time to search there were great numbers of works upon the existence of this other refuge. And some, far back in the years, made assertion with confidence that such a place was in verity and indeed no doubt did there seem in those bygone ages. But now these very records were read only by scholars, who doubted even whilst they read, and so is it ever. But of the reality of this refuge I had never a sound doubt, from the day of my hearing concerning it from our master Monstruaken, who with all his assistants occupied the tower of observation in the apex of the pyramid. And here let me tell that he and I had always an affinity and close friendship, one for the other, though he was full grown and I but a youth. But so it was, and thus when I had come to an age of twenty-one years of life, he opened to me a post within the Tower of Observation, and this was a most wondrous good fortune to me. For in all the vast redoubt to be appointed to the Tower of Observation was the most desired for thereby, even as in these days doth astronomy, was the natural curiosity of man eased somewhat, even while thwarted. Now let me tell here also, lest it be thought that I was unduly favoured because of my friendship with the Master Monster Wagen, that there was a sound justification for his choice, in that to me had been given that strange gift of hearing, which we called night-hearing though this was but a fanciful name and meant little. Yet the peculiar gift was rare, and in all the millions of the pyramid there was none with the gift to a great degree, saving only myself. And I, because of this gift, could hear the invisible vibrations of the ether, so that without harking to the calling of our recording instruments I could take the messages which came continually through the eternal darkness, I even better than they and now it may be the better understood how much was to be counted that I had grown to listen for a voice that had not rung in mine ears for an eternity, and yet which sang sweet and clear in my memory dreams, so that it seemed to me that Murdath the Beautiful slept within my soul and whispered to me out of all the ages. And then one day at the fifteenth hour, when began the sleep-time, I had been pondering this love of mine that lived with me still, and marvelling that my memory-dreams held the voice of a love that had been in so remote an age. And pondering and dreaming thus, as a young man may, I could fancy this eon lost one were whispering beauty into my ears in verity, so clear had my memory grown and so much had I pondered. And lo, as I stood there, harking and communing with my thoughts, I thrilled suddenly, as if I had been smitten, for out of all the everlasting night a whisper was thrilling and thrilling upon my more subtle hearing. 
Through four long years had I listened, since that awakening in the embrasure, when but a youth of seventeen. And now, out of the world darkness and all the eternal years of that lost life, which now I live in this present age of ours, was the whisper come. For I knew it upon that instant. And yet, because I was so taught to wisdom, I answered by no name, but sent the master word through the night, sending it with my brain elements, as I could, and as all may, much or little as may be, if they be not clods. And, moreover, I knew that she who called quietly would have the power to hear without instruments, if, indeed, it were she, and if it were but one of the false callings of the evil forces, or more cunning monsters, or, as was sometimes thought concerning these callings, the house of silence meddling with our souls, then would they have no power to say the master word, for this had been proven through all the everlasting. And, lo, as I stood, trembling and striving not to be tense, which destroys the receptivity, there came thrilling round and round my spiritual essence the throb of the master word, beating steadily in the night as doth that marvellous sound. And then, with all that was sweet in my spirit, I called with my brain elements, Murdath, Murdath, Murdath! And at that instant, the master monster Wakin entered that part of the tower of observation where I stood, and seeing my face, stood very quiet, for though he had not the power of night hearing, he was wise and thoughtful, and took much account of my gift. Moreover, he had but come from the receiving instrument, and thought vaguely to have caught the throb of the master word, though too faint to come proper through the instrument, so that he searched for me in that I, who had the hearing, might listen for it, I being, as I have said, gifted in that wise. And to him I told something of my story, and my thoughts, and my memories, and of that awakening. And thus up to this present happening, and he hearkened with sympathy and a troubled and wondering heart, for in that age a man might talk sanely upon that which, in this age of ours, would be accounted foolishness, and maybe the breathings of insanity. For there, by the refinement of arts of mentality, and the results of strange experiments, and the accomplishment of learning, men were able to conceive of matters now close to our conceptions, even as we of this day may haply give a calm ear to talk, that in the days of our fathers would have been surely set to the count of lunacy. And this is very clear. And all the while that I told my story, I listened with my spirit, but save for a sense of faint, happy laughter that wrapped about me, I heard not, and nothing more, all that day. Here let me put down that, because of my memories and half-memories, I would time and again dispute with our learned men, they being in doubt as to the verity of that olden story of the days of light, and the existence of the sun though something of all this was set out as of truth in our oldest records. But I, remembering, told them many tales that seemed fairy-like to them, and entranced their hearts, even whilst I angered their brains, which refused to take seriously and as verity that which their hearts accepted gladly, even as we received the wonder of poetry into our souls. But the master Monstruakin would listen to aught I had to tell, I though I spoke through hours, and so it would be odd times that, having talked long, drawing my stories from my memory dreams, I would come back again into the present of that future, and lo, all the Monstruakins would have left their instruments and observations and recordings, and be gathered about me. And the master, so sunken in interest that he not to have discovered them neither had I noticed, being so full of the things which had been. But when the master came back to knowledge of that present, he would rouse and chide, and they, all those lesser ones, would fly swiftly and guiltily to their various works. And yet, so I have thought since, each with a muddled and bewildered and thoughtful air upon him, and hungry they were for more, and ever wondering and setting questions about. And so it was also with those others, 
those learned ones who were not of the Tower of Observation, and who disbelieved even whilst they hungered. Listen would they, though I talked from the first hour, which was the dawn to the fifteenth hour, which was the beginning of the night. For the sleep-time was set thus, after other usage and experiment. And odd whiles I found that there were among them men of extraordinary learning who upheld my tellings as tales of verity, and so there was a faction. But later there grew more to believe, and whether they believed or not all were ready to listen, so that I might have spended my days in talk, only that I had my work to do. But the Master Monstruaken believed from the beginning, and was wise always to understand, so that I loved him for this, as for many another dear quality. And so, as may be conceived, among all those millions I was singled out to be known, for the stories that I told went downward through a thousand cities, and presently, in the lowest tier of the underground fields, an hundred miles deep in the earth below the redoubt, I found that the very ploughboys knew something concerning my tellings and gathered about me one time and another when the master monster Waken and I had gone down, regarding some matter that dealt with the earth-current and our instruments. And of the underground fields, though in that age we called them no more than the fields, I should set down a little, for they were the mightiest work of this world, so that even the last redoubt was but a small thing beside them an hundred miles deep lay the lowest of the underground fields, and was an hundred miles from side to side every way. And above it there were three hundred and six fields, each one less in area than that beneath. And in this wise they tapered, until the topmost field which lay direct beneath the lowermost floor of the great redoubt was but four miles every way. And thus it will be seen that these fields, lying one beneath the other, formed a mighty and incredible pyramid of country lands in the deep earth, an hundred miles from the base unto the topmost field. And the whole was sheathed in at the sides with the grey metal of which the redoubt was builded, and each field was pillared and floored beneath the soil with the same compound of wonder. And so was it secure and the monsters could not dig into that mighty garden from without. And all of that underground land was lit, where needed, by the earth current, and that same life-stream fructified the soil, and gave life and blood to the plants and to the trees and to every bush and natural thing. And the making of those fields had taken maybe a million years, and the dump thereof had been cast into the crack whence came the earth-current, and which had bottom beyond all soundings. And this underground country had its own winds and air-currents, so that, to my memory, it was in no ways connected to the monstrous air-shafts of the pyramid. But in this I may be mistaken, for it has not been given to me to know all that is to be known concerning that vast redoubt, nor by any one man could so much knowledge be achieved. Yet that there were wise and justly promoted winds in that underground country I do know, for healthful and sweet they were, and in the cornfields there was the sweet rustle of grain, and in the glad silken laughter of poppies, all beneath a warm and happy light. And here did the millions walk and take excursion, and go orderly or not, even as in these days. And all this have I seen, and the talk of a thousand lovers in the gardens of that place comes back to me, and with it all the memory of my dear one, and of a faint calling that would seem to whisper about me at times, but so faint and attenuated that even I, who had the night-hearing, could not catch its import, and so went listening ever the more intently, and oft-times calling. Now there was a law in the pyramid, tried and healthful, which held that no male should have freedom to adventure into the nightland before the age of twenty-two, and no female ever. Yet that, after such age, if a youth desired greatly to make the adventure, he should receive three lectures upon the dangers of which we had knowledge, 
and a strict account of the mutilatings and horrid deeds done to those who had so adventured. And if, after this had passed over him, he still desired, and if he were accounted healthful and sane, then should he be allowed to make the adventure. And it was accounted honor to the youth who should add to the knowledge of the pyramid. But to all such as went forth into the danger of the nightland, there was set beneath the skin of the inner side of the left forearm a small capsule, and when the wound had healed, then might the youth make the adventure. And the wherefore of this was that the spirit of the youth might be saved if he were entrapped, for then, upon the honour of his soul, must he bite forth the capsule, and immediately his spirit would have safety in death and by this shall you know somewhat the grim and horrid danger of the dark land. And this I have set down because later I was to make huge adventure into those lands, and even at this time some thought of the same had come to me, for always I went listening for that quiet calling, and twice I sent the master word throbbing solemnly through the everlasting night. Yet this I did no more without certainty for the word must not be used lightly. But often would I say with my brain elements, Murdath! Murdath! sending the name out into the darkness, and sometimes would I seem to hear the faint thrilling of the ether around me, as though one answered, but weakly, as it were with a weakened spirit, or by instrument that lacked its earth force. And thus, for a great while, there was no certainty but only a strange anxiousness and no clear answer. Then one day, as I stood by the instruments in the Tower of Observation, at the thirteenth hour there came the thrilling of beaten ether all about me, as it were that all the void was disturbed. And I made the sign for silence, so that the men moved not in all the tower, but bowed over their breathing-bells that all disturbance might cease and again came the gentle thrilling, and broke out into a clear, low calling in my brain. And the calling was my name, the old earth name of this day, and not the name of that age. And the name smote me with the frightenness of fresh awakening memories. And immediately I sent the master word into the night, and all the ether was full of movement, and a silence came and later a beat afar off in the void of a night which only I in all that great redoubt could hear, until the heavier vibrations were come. And in a moment there was all about me the throbbing of the master word, beating in the night a sure answer. Yet before this I knew that Murdath had called, but now had surety. And immediately I said, Murdath! making use of the instruments, and there came a swift and beautiful answer. For out of the dark there stole an old love-name that she only had ever used to me. And presently I minded me of the men and signed to them that they should continue, for the records must not be broken, and now I had the communication full established. And by me stood the master Monstruaken quietly as any young monstruaken waiting with slips to make any notes that were needful, and keeping a strict eye upon those others, but not unkindly. And so, for a space of wonder, I had speech with the girl out in the darkness of the world, who had knowledge of my name, and of the old earth love name, and named herself Murdath. And much I questioned her, and presently, to my sorrow, for it seemed that her name was not truly Murdath, but Nani, neither had she known my name, but that in the library of that place where she abode there had been a story of one named by my name, and called by that sweet love name which she had sent out somewhat ruthless into the night, and the girl's name had been Murdath, and when first she, Nani, had called, there had come back to her a cry of Murdath, Murdath. And this had minded her so strangely of that olden story which had stayed in her memory that she had answered as the maid in that book might have answered. And thus did it seem that 
the utter romance of my memory-love had vanished, and I stood strangely troubled for sorrow of a love of olden times. Yet even then I marveled that any book should have story so much like to mine, yet heeding that the history of all love is writ with one pen. Yet even then, in that hour of my strange and quaintly foolish pain, there came a thing that set me thrilling, though more afterwards when I came to think afresh upon it. For the girl who spoke to me through the night had made some wonder that my voice were not deeper, yet in quiet fashion, and as one who says a thing, scarce wotting what they say. But even to me then there came a sudden hope, for in the olden days of this present age my voice had been very deep. And I said to her that maybe the man in the book was said to have had a deep tone of speech, but she, seeming puzzled, said nay, and at that I questioned her the more, but only to the trouble of her memory and understanding. And strange must it seem that we two should talk on so trivial a matter, when there was so much else that we had need to exchange thought upon. For were a man in this present day to have speech with those who may live within that red planet of Mars within the sky, scarce could the wonder of it exceed the wonder of a human voice coming through that night unto the great redoubt, out of all that lost darkness. For indeed this must have been the breaking of maybe a million years of silence and already, as I came to know later, was the news passing downward from city to city through all the vast pyramid, so that the hour slips were full of the news, and every city eager and excited and waiting. And I better known in that one moment than in all my life before, for that previous calling had been but vaguely put about, and then set to the count of a nature, blown upon over-easily by spirit-winds of the half-memory of dreams. Though it is indeed true, as I have set down before this, that my tales concerning the early days of the world, when the sun was visible and full of light, had gone down through all the cities, and had much comment and setting forth in the hour-slips, and were a cause for speech and argument. Now concerning the voice of this girl coming to us through the darkness of the world, I will set out that which she had to tell, and this indeed but verified the tellings of our most ancient records, which had so long been treated over lightly. There was, it would seem, somewhere out in the lonesome dark of the outer lands, but at what distance none could ever discover, a second redoubt, that was a three-sided pyramid, and moderate small being no more than a mile in height, and scarce three-quarters of a mile along the bases. When this redoubt was first builded, it had been upon the far shore of a sea, where now was no sea, and it had been raised by those wandering humans who had grown weary of wandering, and weary of the danger of night attacks by the tribes of half-human monsters which began to inhabit the earth even so early as the days when the half-gloom was upon the world. And he that had made the plan upon which it was builded was one who had seen the great redoubt, having lived there in the beginning, but escaped because of a correction set upon him for his spirit of irresponsibility, which had made him to cause disturbance among the orderly ones in the lowest city of the great redoubt. Yet in time he too had come to be tamed by the weight of fear of the ever-growing hordes of monsters and the forces that were abroad. And so he, being a master spirit, planned and builded the smaller redoubt, being aided thereto by four millions, who also were weary of the harass of the monsters, but until then had been wanderers because of the restlessness of their blood and they had chosen that place, because there they had discovered a sign of the earth-current in a great valley which led to the shore. For without the earth-current no refuge could have existence. And whilst many builded and guarded and cared for the great camp in which all lived, others worked within a great shaft, and in ten years had made this to a distance of many miles, and therewith they tapped the earth-current, but not a great stream yet a sufficiency as was believed. And presently, after many years, they had builded the pyramid, and taken up their refuge there, and made them instruments and ordained monstruagans, 
so that they had speech daily with the Great Pyramid and thus for many long ages. And the earth current then to begin to fail, and though they labored through many thousands of years, they came to no better resource. And so it was they ceased to have communication with the Great Redoubt, for the current had a lack of power to work the instruments, and the recording instruments ceased to be sensible of our messages. And thereafter came a million years, maybe, of silence, with ever the birthing and marrying and dying of those lonesome humans. And they grew less, and some put this to the lack of the earth current, which dwindled slowly through the centuries of that eternity. And once in a thousand years, maybe, one among them would be sensitive, and able to hear beyond ordinary. And to these, at times, there would seem to come the thrilling of the ether, so that such an one would go listening, and sometimes seem to catch half-messages, and so awaken a great interest in all the pyramid. And there would be turning up of old records, and many words and writings, and attempts to send the master word through the night, in which doubtless sometimes they succeeded for there was set down in the records of the great redoubt certain occasions on which there had come the call of the master word, which had been arranged and made holy between the two redoubts in the early days of that second life of this world. Yet now for a hundred thousand years there had been none sensitive, and in that time the people of the pyramid had become no more than ten thousand, and the earth current was weak and powerless to put the joy of life into them so that they went listlessly, but deemed it not strange, because of so many eons of usage. And then, to the wonder of all, the earth current had put forth a new power, so that young people ceased to be old over soon, and there was happiness and a certain joy in the living, and a strange birthing of children, such as had not been through half a million years. And then came a new thing. Nani, the daughter of the master Monstruakin of that redoubt, had shown to all that she was sensitive, for she had perceived odd vibrations afloat in the night, and concerning these she told her father, and presently, because their blood moved afresh in their bodies, they had heart to discover the plans of the ancient instruments, for the instruments had long rusted and been forgotten. And so they builded them a new instrument to send forth the message for they had no memory at that time that the brain elements had power to do thus. Though, mayhap, their brain elements were weakened, through so many ages of starvation of the earth current, and could not have obeyed, even had their masters known all that we of the great redoubt knew. And when the instrument was finished, Tunani was given the right to call first across the dark to discover whether, indeed, after that million years of silence, they were yet companied upon this earth, or whether they were in truth lonely, the last poor thousands of the humans. And a great and painful excitement came upon the people of the Lesser Pyramid, for the loneliness of the world pressed upon them, and it was to them as though we in this age call to a star across the abyss of space. And because of the excitement and pain of the moment, Nani called only vaguely with the instrument into the dark, and lo, in a moment, as it seemed, there came all about her in the night the solemn throb of the master word, beating in the night. And Nani cried out that she was answered, and, as may be thought, many of the people wept, and some prayed, and some were silent, but others beseeched her that she call again and quickly to have further speech with those of their kind and Nani spoke the master word into the night, and directly there came a calling all about her. Murdath! Murdath! And the strange wonder of it made her silent a moment. But when she would have made reply, the instrument had ceased to work, and she could have no further speech at that time. This, as may be thought, occasioned much distress and constant work they had between the instrument and the earth current to discover the reason for this failing but could not for a great while. And in that time oft did Nani hear the call of Murdath thrilling about her, and twice there came the solemn beat of their master-word in the night. Yet never had she the power to answer. 
and all that while, as I learned in time, was she stirred with a quaint ache at heart by the voice that called Murdath as it might be the spirit of love. Searching for its mate, for this is how she put it. And thus it chanced that the constant thrilling of this name about her woke her to memory of a book she had read in early years, but half understood. For it was ancient, and writ in an olden fashion, and it set out the love of a man and a maid, and the maid's name was Murdath. And so, because she was full of this great awakening of those ages of silence, and the calling of that name, she found the book again, and read it many times, and grew to a sound love of the beauty of that tale. And presently, when the instrument was made right, she called into the night the name of that man within the book. And so it came about that I had hoped too much, yet even now was I strangely unsure whether to cease from hoping. And one other thing there is which I would make clear. Many and oft a time had I heard a thrilling of sweet, faint laughter about me, and the stirring of the ether by words too gentle to come clearly, and these, I make no doubt, came from Nani, using her brain elements unwittingly and in ignorance, but very eager to answer my callings, and having no knowledge that far off across the blackness of the world they thrilled about me constantly. And after Nani had made clear all that I have set out concerning the lesser refuge, she told further how that food was not plentiful with them, though until the reawakening of the earth current they had gone unknowing of this, being of small appetite, and caring little for aught. But now, wakened and newly hungry, they savoured a lack of taste in all that they ate, and this we could well conceive, from our reasonings and theory, but happily not from our knowledge. And we said unto them that the soil had lost its life, and the crops therefrom were not vital, and a great while it would take for the earth within their pyramid to receive back the life elements. And we told them certain ways by which they might bring a more speedy life to the soil and this they were eager to do, being freshly alive after so long a time of half-life. And now you must know that in all the great redoubt the story went downward swiftly, and was published in all the hour-sheets, with many comments, and the libraries were full of those who would look up the olden records, which for so long had been forgotten, or taken, as we of this day would say, with a pinch of salt and all the time I was pestered with questions, so that, had I not been determined, I should scarce have been allowed to sleep. Moreover, so much was writ about me, and my power to hear, and the diverse stories concerning tales of love, that I had been like to have grown mazed to take note of it all, yet some note I did take, and much I found pleasant, but some displeasing and for the rest I was not spoiled, as the saying goes, for I had my work to do. Moreover, I was always busy listening, and having speech through the darkness. Though if any saw me so, they would question, and because of this I kept much to the tower of observation, where was the master monstruaken and a greater discipline. And then began a fresh matter though but an old enough trick, for I speak now of the days that followed that reopening of the talk between the pyramids. Oft would speech come to us out of the night, and there would be tales of the sore need of the lesser redoubt, and callings for help. Yet when I sent the master word abroad, there would be no answering, and so I feared that the monsters and forces of evil knew. Yet at times the master word would answer to us, beating steadily in the night, and when we questioned afresh we knew that they in the lesser redoubt had caught the beat of the master word, and so made reply, though it had not been they who had made the previous talk, which we had sought to test by the word. And then they would make contradiction of all that had been spoken so cunningly, so that we knew that monsters and forces had sought to tempt some from the safety of the redoubt. Yet was this no new thing, as I have made to hint, saving that it grew now to a greater persistence, and there was a loathsome cunning in the using of this new language to the making of wicked and false messages by those evil things of the nightland. 
and it told to us, as I have made remark, how that those monsters and forces had a full awareness of the speech between the pyramids, yet could they have no power to say the master word. So had we some test left, and a way to sure knowledge of what may talk in the night. And all that I have told you should bring to those of this age something of the yet unbegotten terror of that, and a quiet and sound thankfulness to God that we suffer not as humanity shall yet suffer. But for all this, let it not be thought that they of that age accounted it as suffering, but as no more than the usual of human existence. And by this may we know that we can meet all circumstances, and use ourselves to them and live through them wisely, if we be but prudent and consider means of invention. And through all the nightland there was an extraordinary awakening among the monsters and forces, so that the instruments made constant note of greater powers at work out there in the darkness. And the monster wakens were busied recording and keeping a very strict watch. And so was there at all that time a sense of difference and awakening, and of wonders about and to come. And from the country whence comes the great laughter, the laughter sounded constant, as it were an uncomfortable and heart-shaking voice-thunder rolling thence over the lands, out from the unknown east. And the pit of the red smoke filled all the deep valley with redness, so that the smoke rose above the edge and hid the bases of the towers upon the far side. And the giants could be seen plentiful around the kilns to the east, and from the kilns great belches of fire, though the meaning of it, as all else, we could not say, but only the cause. And from the mountain of the voice, which rose to the southeast of the southeast watcher, and of which I have made no telling hitherto in this faulty setting out, I heard for the first time in that life the calling of the voice, and though the records made mention of it, yet not often was it heard. And the calling was shrill, and very peculiar, and distressful, and horrible, as though a giant woman, hungering strangely, shouted unknown words across the night. And this was how it seemed to me, and many thought this to describe the sound. And by all this you may perceive how that land was awakened. And other tricks there were to entice us into the nightland. And once a call came thrilling in the ether, and told to us that certain humans had escaped from the lesser redoubt, and drew nigh to us, but were faint for food and craved succor. Yet when we sent the master word into the night, the creatures without could make no reply, which was a very happy thing for our souls, for we had been all mightily exercised in our hearts by this one message, and now had proof that it was but a trap. And constantly, and at all hours, I would have speech with Nani and of the lesser redoubt, for I had taught her how she might send her thoughts through the night with her brain elements, but not to overuse this power for it exhausts the body and the powers of the mind, if it be abused by exceeding usage. Yet, despite that I had taught her the use of her brain elements, she sent her message always without strength, save when she had use of the instrument, and this I set to the cause that she had not the health force needful. But apart from this, she had the night hearing very keen, though less than mine. And so, with many times of speech and constant tellings of our doings and thoughts, we drew near in the spirit to one another, and had always a feeling in our hearts that we had been given previous acquaintance. And this, as may be thought, thrilled my heart very strangely. End of chapter 3